Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have some questions. How bad is America's amnesia when it comes to race? And can it reconcile with its racist past without leading to more racism? Let's get to the bottom line. In classrooms and TV channels across the United States, the debate on how to teach American history is all the rage. It's the latest chapter in the country's culture wars. This week, President Joe Biden marked the 100th anniversary of a long forgotten, I should say long covered up massacre of black Americans in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a place called Black Wall Street, because the folks there were thriving. Historians say hundreds were killed and thousands became refugees when their white neighbors burned their houses and businesses. The whole episode was whitewashed from the American conscience until very recently. Many historians, teachers, activists, and now the president say it's about time to teach children about 400 years of white supremacy and modern discrimination against black and brown people in everything from housing to health care and everyday justice. Critics call this critical race theory, and they tend to be energetic supporters of former President Donald Trump. They say that this line of questioning weakens the idea that America is the greatest country in the world and leads folks to look at everything through a racial lens and promotes a Marxist view of history and economics. They definitely don't want to teach stuff like the Tulsa race massacre. So in such a divided country, which historical narrative is it? Today, we're joined by Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, the president of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, who attended a major commemoration ceremony of the Tulsa Black Massacre and was there with three survivors of that awful day, as well as President Joe Biden. Reverend Barber, it's a real pleasure to be with you again. Let me just open up. You were in Tulsa for a reason. You were there to help repair the breach among those who wanted to cover up an atrocity in America's history uh, and, and those who don't want to look at that. Tell us about that moment. Well, you know, it's eerie ground to stand on. Uh, it's an open crime scene with witnesses yet alive. There's never been a full independent autopsy, economic autopsy, public health autopsy. Uh, and it was a killing and a massacre and a cover-up that the government led. I want folks to get it. It was not just people out. The government sanctioned it and allowed it to happen. And then after all of the killing, the community came back, and then the government destroyed it again through policies of urban renewal. Um, and yet, like the Bible says in Genesis, when Cain killed Abel, the blood of Abel kept crying from the ground. Almost so you can kill the people, but the blood still cries, and the blood is still crying for us not only to remember and mourn, but to have reparations and repair. Uh, um, it forces us to deal with this issue. Race is the son of racism, not the other way around. Mm. In other words, race, race, systemic racism, the desire to systemically policy and legally discriminate people against a certain people came first. And then the decision to make it based on race came second. So if you don't understand that, you can tend to think that race is just about hatred. But systemic racism is about power, economic power, land power, political power. That's what we have to understand in a moment like this. Otherwise, we'll just memorialize the death and we'll turn this great, this massacre site into a tourism site rather than a place of transformation and reparation. Right. I want to go for a moment to President Biden's remarks. President Biden is the first U.S. president to fully acknowledge uh, the, the death and harassment that happened that day 100 years ago in Tulsa. Let's listen to President Biden. Millions of white Americans belong to the Klan, and they weren't even embarrassed by it. They were proud of it. And that hate became embedded systematically and systemically in our laws and our culture. We do ourselves no favors by pretending none of this ever happened or it doesn't impact us today because it does still impact us today. We can't just choose to learn what we want to know and not what we should know. Reverend Barber, this happened 100 years ago. My family, my own family, helped settle Bartlesville, Oklahoma, just north of Tulsa. And I did not know about this incident until I visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And I was appalled by my own ignorance. 
how much more is buried out there in America that we, we people like me who want to know simply don't know about uh, black Americans, their, their stresses and their contributions? Yeah, uh, about Native Americans, about black Americans, about Latino, you know, and, 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 and some may say it's amnesia, but, you know, amnesia t tends to happen accidentally, like you hit yourself on the head accidentally. This is intentional neglect. This is revisionist history. This is refusing to engage in critical race theory. You know, I actually take that language and, and turn it on the folk that want to use it as a negative. We should have critical race theory. We should be critical of the way in which history has been undertold and not told. And, you know, there were more than a dozen that we know of massacres of this kind from 1863 to uh, 1923. You should also know the significance of Biden going there, because when this riot happened, there was a racist narcissist sitting in the presidency named Woodrow Wilson, very educated, had been president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey. But he played the movie Birth of a Nation in the Oval Office and said it was lightning in a bottle and the kind of history that we needed to teach. And it, that movie celebrated the Klan and celebrated the Klan massacring communities. It also happened right during a pandemic, when the president had lied about the pandemic and tried to blame it 100 years ago on Spanish people, rather than call it what it was, the swine flu. So it's eerie how you have these similarities. There is so much more. You've got Wilmington in 1898. You have Springfield. Let us not forget that in the early uh, 1900s, uh, early, late 1800s, early 1900s, right after the Plessy versus Perkins decision, and when many black soldiers came back from World War One, you had a whole series of massacres. Uh, you had massacres, you know, to, to stop the slave revolts. This is American history. It's not just black history. It's American history. And you had whites in 1921s that helped black people. And then you had certain white supremacists that wanted to do more damage than they did. And we cannot cover up. We also, and this is what's important about the president going, he has now said, as the American president, this was a massacre. Because he used that language, you now must use the language of reparations. So you can't say it's a massacre and then just say, well, we're going to maybe rebuild a road or or, or, or rebuild uh, or some monuments. No, no, no. If it was a massacre, that means you have to deal with the loss that happened then and the potential loss. What was the potential gain for this community? What would have happened? What happens when children get cut off from education? What happens when you undermine a community? This is oil land. Did somebody steal the oil as well? What would have happened if those banks had franchised or those hotels had franchised? So we're probably talking in the billions of dollars of what it would take to actually do the economic reparation, which is one of the reasons last year that we said to a group of leaders yesterday, we must have an independent autopsy, an independent commission of economists, public health officials, environmentalists, lawyers, and historians like uh, to put together a real history of what was lost both then and potentially. And then we have to talk about what reparations really look like. Well, let me ask you a question about those that don't understand that moment in Tulsa quite, quite as much. They're, they're proud of America. They look at America's role in the world. They saw America's performance in World War II. Uh, they saw you know, black, white, and brown people serving together in the military, but they're unaware of a lot of this anguish and terror in, in the past. Is there a way to, to acknowledge uh, Tulsa, to acknowledge uh, what's happened to black Americans and brown Americans, and still find a place to be proud of the United States? How do you reconcile those? Because that's what the critics of critical race theory are putting forward. They don't want to put a blight on social studies, which, by the way, a lot of Americans are not getting anymore in schools. But that's what how they're looking at it. And, and I look at knowing everything is good, but they're saying, nah, -uh, we don't want to have that, that part of the equation in it. What's your well, response, the, Reverend the, the, Barber? Racism is a form of mental illness. And mental illness, you don't want to deal with reality. So let's just understand that those that don't want to tell this history, that's a whole nother issue. It's not even about just wanting, not wanting America to look good. They don't want the truth to be told, because the truth is the truth. Now, think about it. We tell the truth about Benedict Arnold. 
we tell the truth about the wrong we did in Vietnam, why is it when it comes to issue of racism and slavery and what happened to indigenous people and, and people of color, all of a sudden we want people to forget it? Though, how do you do it? You tell the truth. That's the only thing that can set you free. It's the only thing that can set this country free. But the problem with telling the truth about systemic racism is you have to acknowledge the theft. You have to acknowledge the, the, the economic destruction. You have to acknowledge that this country is built on top of 250 years of forced labor, where we chose to make people chattel. Now, can you say the country is great, but also has great flaws? That's what black folk have had to do all our lives. My daddy was in the Navy. He fought for this country when the Navy was segregated. It was not integrated. He was willing to give first-class blood for second-class citizenship because he had hope for the nation. But he also knew that that hope could not live in denial. That hope had to tell the truth. And that's why those who want to cover up they don't want to face the truth, which is the only way for us to be free, the only way to repair the damage. And you know what's interesting? The young people want the truth. That's mm. why you see all of these young white folk watching with Black Lives Matters. That's why in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for Marvel, you see all these young black and white and Latino and Asian, they're tired of the lies. They're tired of us thinking that American exceptionalism means perfection. For me as a Christian, that's not even godly. You can't. I'm not perfect. No person is perfect. But America has deep sins from which she has yet to repent. In fact, real quickly, do you know that there were five underpinnings of slavery and racism in this country? First of all was, 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 was evil economics, and that is the end justifies the means. It doesn't matter how you get the money, even if you have to enslave people. Bad biology, you can determine brain size by skin color. Sick sociology, that some people had to be down in order for other people to be up. Political pathology, where every piece of public policy, from the Declaration to the Constitution, always had to have a race consideration uh, in it, a way of discriminating. And then the last thing was heretical ontology, that there were, there were all kinds of attempts made to say, God meant it this way. This racism, this slavery is of the order of the divine. We have to repent of those things because they still hurt us today. That's why we're having a battle over voting rights right now. That's why we, we couldn't get 15 and a union passed, because people are looking at it through the race lens. How will it impact black people and brown people? And lastly, like Dr. King says, true love and true truth has to help people understand that white people face a collateral damage because of race. How, how much better would Tulsa have been as a whole, not just black Tulsa, but Tulsa as a whole, if, if black Wall Street had not been destroyed, but instead had flourished? I mean, we have to ask all of these questions and be serious about it. Reverend, you know, you've been at this for a long time. You and I have had these discussions before, but I think there's no running away from the truth that many white Americans in the United States look at the fact that if there were reparations, if we began to have big programs like President Biden talked about uh, in Tulsa of spending billions of dollars on minority-owned businesses, of fixing neighborhoods that were, you know, left out and because of transportation decisions, you know, helping to get money back into these communities and community development and whatnot, that they look at that as a cost to them, that if one side wins, the other side loses. It's a zero-sum game between the races. What do you say to that? Again, that's wrong economic. <laughs> if, first of all, we need a set third reconstruction to deal with poverty and low wages, just not just based on race, just on based on poverty and low wages, because we got 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. And so what we're doing isn't working, because if it was, we wouldn't have over 43 percent of the people living in poverty. And after the pandemic, we've seen 8 million more people fall into poverty, while billionaires made $2 trillion. Uh, we didn't even give, even white workers didn't even give a raise, a raise in their living wages. We've not provided universal health care. So as Dr. King said, and I quote, that when you keep down one community, you actually undermine all the communities. So what we should look at is that these are investments. If you invest in reparations, and if not just reparations, if you invest in infrastructure and invest in living wages and invest in health care, then actually those investments come back. The question we should ask 
about all of this is the question that Nobel Peace Prize uh, economist asked Joseph Stiglitz when he said, what is the cost of the inequality? Not what does it cost to fix it, but what is the cost of the inequality itself? And the cost of the inequality is greater than uh, 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 fixing it. And that's where we must focus on. We cannot say as a nation, we establish justice and we leave these injustices undealt with. We cannot say we promote the general welfare of all people, but then we say, except if you were massacred and except you were black. The reality is either all of us rise in America or we're going to all be held down. So we need not only reparations, but we need a third reconstruction. We need to have health care for all. We need to have living wages. We need to have full investment in education. We need to finally decide we're going to deal with the issue of poverty and low wages, that things do not have to be this way. We should use the past failures as the energy and the encouragement for, to promote today's transformation. So that 50 years from now, people can say a people rose who decided mm. to move in love and truth and things became better. Listen, all of these things we see, even this massacre, they were policy decisions. If, as James Baldwin said, if we made it this way, we can, I'm paraphrasing, we can change it. We can fix it. The question is, will we have the social and prophetic and moral consciousness to, in fact, fix it? So I'm glad the president was there. But now that he has called it what it is, the question is, will we have a sufficient policy response to the accurate history? That's the question. Will we have a sufficient reparations and reconstruction response to this ugly history? And if there is, guess what? All Oklahomans were right. Let me say this lastly. When we talk about Oklahoma, and it's amazing how many people say, well, we don't want to do re re reparations. Do you know how most Oklahomans got their land? There was something called the Homestead Act. And they were given free land. They lined 50,000 people up at the border, shot a gun, and they took off. And wherever they came to land, they could stake their claim and get, get hundreds of acres of land. That's the other part of the history we've also got to tell, my brother, is that everybody who claims they pulled themselves up by their own bootstrap, they don't even know American history. They're not dealing with reality. The reality is that we have repaired, we repaired Germany when we bombed it. We repaired the, the slave masters after the Civil War. The only people we've not repaired have been Native Americans and African Americans. And yet we're all here in this country. If we all get repaired, then the whole nation gets fixed. And if we raise up from the bottom, everybody gets lifted. You mentioned the third reconstruction, Reverend, and I want to tell our audience that you wrote very powerfully about this in the New York Times recently, sharing what the first reconstruction, the second reconstruction, and you said, now is the time for the third reconstruction. But in my view, you were doubtful that we would achieve that now. What is that? I mean, I know you're setting the bar for what we need to do, but I sense doubt and skepticism that we're at the political moment to make that happen. Can you go further? Well, I hope not. What I, what I do have, what I do have, is realism and recognize that the first two reconstructions were murdered and assassinated. They were never completed. Hmm. So I, I have no doubt that there will be. I have, you know, doubt that everybody's going to agree. I know it's dangerous when you start challenging the ruling class and talking and and telling the truth about the ungodly and pornographic uh, sums of money that go to a few and and the, and the so little that goes to so many. Um, but here's the question, here's for us is the, is the consideration. It's either reconstruction or an impoverished democracy. So we got to decide, well, do we want a strong democracy or an impoverished democracy? And if we want that, then we have to change. We have to have a reconstruction. And this is not about Marxism, socialism, you know, you call all those things people want to call. No, it's what it is. It's a reconstruction. It's what America needed after the Civil War. And it was working until racism and hate destroyed it. It's what America needed in the civil rights movement, until hate shot it and assassinated it. And we, that, we were two we tried. We need a third one. Now, will it be easy? No. Is it going to be hard? Yes, because there are so many forces that want to see this not happen. And they automatically say, this is just about black people. But the Poor People's Campaign right. says a third reconstruction is about all people, all people. Uh, the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 
who are poor because of policy choice, poor and low wealth, policy choices and not their own personal morality. Rev Reverend, in our last minute, I want to ask you a question about something President Trump has said, which is, you know, he talked, and I've talked to some black Americans in Atlanta who support President Trump, uh, brown Americans around the nation that do. He said, said, you know, you've got black mayors, you've got black governors, you've got black leaders, you've got uh, folks that are out there, and, and, and have they delivered for you? Uh, why not take a chance on him and what he's done? And, and, you know, in the last election, he actually got quite a number of, of uh, brown Americans and black Americans to support him. What is the response? What is, what is, is there something wrong in the story about that we've had in the past about uh, blacks rising from the past and, 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 and building bridges with those in assets and whatnot politically? Uh, and what President Trump is saying, hey, you, you, you've, it, it's the wrong side of the equation over there. Join me. Well, he, he got some. He didn't get the majority, you know, because people knew he was just talking, but he was talking nonsense because the reality is he was saying, try me, but then he was saying, I'm going to be against health care. Try me, and I'm going to be against voting rights. Try me, and I'm going to be against living wages. Uh, try me, and I'm going to give more money to the corporate elite and less to the community. And so he was just running a con. That's what he was right. doing. And we black people have looked at public policy. Plus, he was lying. Sure, there are some black leaders that have been disconnected from the community. Dr. King talked about that. But right. that doesn't mean that's the totality. But I will also I will say this. Last 30 seconds. Whether you're black or white or whatever, none of this country as a whole, Democrat and Republican, has not fully faced the issue of systemic racism and poverty and low wages and ecological devastation and health care and the war economy, black or white, and how it impacts all people. That's what we're fighting for. We've got, we, I don't care what party you're in, until we address these five issues simultaneously mm. in policy, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, and the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white evangelicalism, until we address all five of them simultaneously, I don't care who you are, what your color is, we have not built the America that ought be and the America that's possible if we have the conscience to do it. We don't have a scarcity of money or a scarcity of solution. We've had a scarcity of moral consciousness and will. Well, Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, the second president of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, thank you so much for sharing your candid thoughts with us today. Thank you, my friend. Bless you always. So what's the bottom line? If you ask two Americans, one black and one white, what they think about racism in the USA, here's what will happen. Most white Americans will tell you that black people don't face a lot of discrimination today, that those days were long ago and there's been progress and that things are really evening out. And if you ask most black and brown Americans the same exact question, they'll say exactly the opposite, that black people face discrimination every single day, all the time, starting with applications to work or to college or random stops by the police, to all the opportunities and assets that a lot of white Americans start with compared to theirs, which is often little to none. I agree with my guest, Reverend Barber, today. One election cannot bring about the brutally honest racial reckoning the country desperately needs. It's a start, though, and it opens the door to getting beyond the collective amnesia on racism and starting to talk about it honestly and openly, finally. But you know what we need to do right now? We need a moment of zen. Here's my guest singing with Mr. Hughes Van Ellis, a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre 100 years ago after President Biden's speech there on Tuesday. I ain't gonna let no racism turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking. Keep on a talking, walking up to freedom. One more time, everybody. Ain't gonna let nobody. Come on, y'all.